So today, we're going to be looking at some pretty crazy stuff, so some of you may know about this, but if you haven't seen the other Tartaria Explained videos, make sure you go check them out in the description. So I wanted to just start with taking a look at some classical artworks. Like, didn't you think that it was pretty weird in history class when we learned about art and Raphael, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and this really does apply for literature as well, but it seems that this all came out of nowhere. I mean, according to their timeline, it all kind of starts around the 1500s and then it all picks up in the 1600s, right, with what we call the Renaissance period and these seemingly advanced skills of painting and realistic perspective just all of a sudden appear out of nowhere with what's called Brunelleschi perspective and these two artists, Masaccio and Perugino. So let's go ahead and take a look at the history of perspective. It kind of all starts with this Brunelleschi figure and Masaccio if they were real people. And it's interesting, they bring up here that even in the past that the medieval artist did try to do some things with shadowing to create depth, but it's not the same as what these artists were doing. The linear perspective system projected the illusion of depth onto a two-dimensional plane by the use of vanishing points, to which all lines converged at eye level on the horizon. Soon after Brunelleschi's paintings, the concept caught on and many Italian artists started to use a linear perspective in their paintings. So this guy, which was an architect, basically comes up with this vanishing point system and then all the other artists caught on and start producing the greatest art that's ever been made. And it just seems that there could be some type of cover up to this whole art movement that we're not really told about. Like, it really just seems like something we should question. I mean, we don't really see this kind of style of art. And, you know, we learn about this, these early Renaissance paintings, and it just seems kind of weird. And that even with this painting, right? Like this famous painting, this one's from Perugino, I think. You see these Tartarian buildings in the background with this Antiquitech on top and what's happening here? They're giving Jesus a key? I mean, is this symbolic for something? And it just seems like this is a skill that wasn't necessarily brought about randomly, but something that was either transferred from the old world or possibly some type of technology that we're not told about. It also could be that they're just the remnants of the art from another civilization that they all kind of classified into specific artists in order to cover it up. It just seems strange that there's this abrupt change in skill level. Like if you compare the medieval art and then all of a sudden go to like, you know, Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci, it just seems that there's too much of a change without any type of explanation on how these techniques developed in any single way. And I mean, this the same goes for music and the literature. It all kind of just sprouts out of nowhere in the same time period. And it really just makes you wonder, you know, did they steal this from some past civilization? Or do these artworks themselves belong to the old world? Or better yet, maybe there was some type of technology that could assist in making realistic paintings. I've mentioned this in other videos with the engravings and, you know, some people think it's crazy, but... And obviously there's artists who can truly paint these types of things, but it just makes you wonder if they had automatic music composition makers and advanced astrological computing devices. Well, maybe there was some type of tech that was covered up in order to, you know, hide the origins of this whole style of painting. 
you know maybe maybe so maybe someone painted it or this is a secret technique using equipment of some sort and they don't want people to know about it well the reason is is because creating a new false history in which the leading figures of the new jesuit church right all these artists they come from florence and so they created this new false history by creating these fake artists basically in which the leading figures of the new jesuit church became the leaders and the founders of this entire enlightenment period giving them power to rule for ages to come so there very well could be an incentive for hiding this there are so many paintings that get destroyed from the old world in order to protect this secret and there are many accounts of these artworks being found in old Tartarian buildings and the whole art scam. But basically in this, in these Gilded Age mansions, right? They had all these paintings and extravagant art and sculptures in these buildings. And again, it kind of ties into this might be out, out of the scope of this video. But basically, it's really just about questioning art. At least the art that we're told from the 17th century or the, the Renaissance period. It's to start to look at that with different eyes. So if we can start there. What we really need to do is begin questioning some of the most famous artists we know, right? And most of these artists are multi-talented architects. Um, we know that Raphael was extremely young. And again, it's all about questioning these famous figures that we were told about in history. Did they really make these? Or is there something else going on here? Leonardo da Vinci. Right, you have Leonardo and all his extravagant in inventions. Let's check those out. And he was basically way ahead of his time and he was depicting flying machines, weaponry, generators, and it really just makes you think like, what if these are from another world or from the old world and the new Jesuit church, right? trying to cover this up and not only that trying to take um credit for all of this they basically put it all on these made up figures and made them these basically superhumans who were essentially the greatest artist and generalist who ever lived or maybe there's something else going on and again you know why would they do this it's all about hiding this past advanced artistic society with skills that are probably beyond our imagination or they had technology that's beyond what we view their capabilities to be. And when we look at the Sistine Chapel, there's really nothing else quite like it. And you notice that all these beginning Renaissance artists, they all have kind of a similar look and style as if they may be using very similar techniques or maybe the same type of application or technology. You know, they couldn't just steal all this artwork, right? And then just put it all under Leonardo. I mean, it just wouldn't really work if it was just one artist. So they needed to kind of split this up between multiple artists in order to queue up this agenda of being the founder of the intellectual movement. But again, almost all of them come out of Italy, Florence. So okay and then you have michelangelo who was one of the greatest painters and sculptors of all time so this is kind of where we get to the next mind blow but let's just look at some sculptures that seem pretty impossible to create i mean there really isn't an artist today that could create something like this with the same material without using modern tools like saws and polishers so, I mean, just starting with David. Now, it seems extremely unlikely that this was sculpted at this size with just a chisel. 
I mean, I know this is a story that we're all told, but we're questioning the official narrative right now. And when we look at the history, David was commissioned by the Catholic Jesuit Church to be placed along the roof line of the east end of the Florence Cathedral. But somehow or another, it ended up in the public square. So the greatest and most famous sculpture of all time was just out in the public. And if you look at the old photos, look how much grime and wear and there's even cracks on it. So we know that they have created an exact replica of it, right? and then supposedly moved the original into the art museum where it lost its famous leaf. And they say that it's been repaired, but I'm not sure if either of those are the original one, but let's just take a look at what it would take to sculpt out of marble in the modern day. I mean, so these marble sculptors are using power tools in order to get the job done. And you can really tell that it doesn't have the same finesse that these Renaissance 
Renaissance sculptors had. I mean, they were creating stuff that cannot be replicated today. And so it really just makes you think that maybe they had a secret technique that was never revealed. I think this is a pretty crazy one too, is that you have this net rope that's entirely made from marble. I mean, come on. I mean, just look at the details. And again, I know artists are very talented, but there's just something about sculpting with marble to this level of detail that just seems fantastical, dreamlike, impossible. I mean, you know, obviously that's why they're so famous, but why can't artists even compete with this today? Okay, yeah, and here's another famous one. I mean, just look at the realism and the level of detail in the fabric. It's not realistic that they just did this from chisel. And so, is it possible that these are actually petrified peoples? I know that may be a stretch for many of you, and another possibility is that they had some type of carving technology that was used by the ancients, and then after the reset they used this technology for creating advanced sculptures for art and for architecture. I think it's a little bit of both, but many have suggested that this type of carving or melting of stone technology existed in many other ancient cultures like Tiahonako and Punka Punku. They have such precise cuts that many say it's aliens, right? But there are myths and legends and researchers who are saying that they may have been able to soften the stone so that they can manipulate it. Now, that's just the technology aspect, but there really is something to this whole idea that you can petrify or the petrification of humans. They could have had this technology that turned people into stone and then on top of that, they would do more details to manipulate it or to change it around to kind of hide the fact that it's actually a human. And if we look at this with open eyes, we'll find that there are actually a lot of legends speaking of this concept of petrification with humans or man being turned into stone. In Greek mythology, there's the well-known legend of Medusa, also called a Gorgo which was one of the three monstrous Gorgons. Generally, she was described as a winged human female with living venomous snakes in place of hair. Those who glazed into her eyes would turn into stone. This could be the ancient myth that is referring to some type of plasma apocalypse from the sky. Female being some type of spirit energy and the snakes being plasma forms in the sky, turning the peoples into stone. And I'm guessing that this happened to the people who witnessed it because they didn't go underground, perhaps. In European legends, a basilisk is a legendary reptile reputed to be a serpent king who can cause death by its glaze that would turn its victims into stone. In Norse cosmology, Savar Tafar, or the Black Elves, Swarthy Elves, are also called Mirkalfar who would grow from the maggots of Ymir's flesh and turn to stone when exposed to daylight. You'll find that there are many references in these myths talking about these creatures or these dark creatures turning into stone once they hit the sunlight. This is just from the myth side of specific creatures and or demons that could possibly be from another realm that could even possess this type of stone conversion technology. Or it's some type of symbolism for a metaphysical catastrophic event. And isn't it weird that we have this saying of being petrified for when you're scared? And this concept literally comes from this idea of being frozen or turned into stone. But is there maybe something more to the saying. And so this is where it really starts to get crazy because not only do you have like these fantastical myths of, you know, is it symbolism or these creatures that turn you into stone? So it makes it a little bit more fantastical, but you have many legends talking about someone being turned into stone as a form of punishment, which makes you really think that it was some type of weapon or some type of technology that 
they had in the past. In the Catholic Jesuit stories of Saint Barbara, it's recounted that when the saint was pursued by her sword-wielding father, Dioscorus, he learned of his daughter's acceptance of the new faith. Her location was given away by a shepherd. The shepherd was then punished for his deed by being turned into stone, while his flock was turned into locust. It's also interesting to note that Saint Barbara was a Phoenician, so this is some kind of reference speaking of the transition between paganism of the old world and the new religious world. There is a painting that kind of shows this, and they never really discuss in the legends how he was turned into stone. The father was a pagan, and so the idea is that he had some type of magic in order to do this. I also forgot to mention that after Medusa was killed by Perseus, it was used as a weapon to turn enemies into stone. In Homer's Odyssey, it's mentioned that Poseidon turned a ship of the Phaeacians into stone. And that name is very close to the Phoenicians, but it's not the same. And their punishment was for having helped his foe, Odysseus. Battus was a figure in Greek mythology who witnessed Hermes stealing Apollo's cattle. He agreed to keep the affair secret, but when Hermes returned to disguise to test him, he broke his word and was punished by being turned into stone. Now back to what I was saying about the statues. If they really knew of some type of petrifaction process in the past, don't you think they would try to use it? It gets better too. There are several references to statues that have a myth associated with it being a human in the past. In a Czech village called Druzek, there is a sandstone Marian column from 1674 and a man-sized stone called Zakamenelik, man turned into stone, surrounded with legends of a punished perjurer or blasphemer. At the village of Nowa Slupia in Poland, there is this so-called stone pilgrim, a stone figure of a kneeling man, located near main entrance to the national park. According to a legend, the figure once was a vain knight who went on a pilgrimage to the abbey. Upon hearing the sound of the bells, he stated that they tolled in his honor, for which he was punished and turned into stone. The Lincoln Imp is a grotesque on a wall inside Lincoln Cathedral, England. It had become the symbol of the city of Lincoln. A legend tells of it being a creature sent to the cathedral by Satan, only to be turned into stone by an angel. The Christian saint, Saint Hilda or Hilda, was credited with having miraculously turned snakes into stone. The ammonite fossils found in large numbers at San San Ness were considered as such. The coat of arms of nearby Whitby actually included three such snake stones. The Merry Maidens, a late Neolithic stone circle located two miles to the south of the village of St. Burion in Cornwall, United Kingdom, are considered by local myth to be 19 maidens who were turned into stone as punishment for dancing on a Sunday. This idea is very popular in Gaelic myths, such as with the nine maidens of Boscadnan, the Tregazial dancing stones, and the hurlers. They say that the Cardiff giant was a massive hoax, but now it kind of makes you really think. Who knows, maybe there's something else to the story when you take into consideration all the myths. An Icelandic legend about the island of Drangi says that two night prowling giants, a man and a woman, were traversing the Jord with their cow when they were surprised by the bright rays of daybreak. As a result of the exposure to daylight, all three were turned into stone. The aboriginal legend from Australia of the Three Sisters, a rock formation in Australia, is about three sisters from the Blue Mountains who fell in love with three men from the neighboring Dorok tribe but the marriage was forbidden by tribal law. Their brothers were not happy to accept this law and so decided to capture the three sisters. A major tribal battle followed and the sisters were turned into stone by an elder to protect them, but he was killed in the fighting and no one else could turn them back. Malin Kundang is a folktale originated from Indonesia, with similar versions spread around other regions in Southeast Asia. The story was about a poor sailor who became rich owned trading galleons and married a princess through hard works. However, when he came back to his village, he was ashamed to his poor mother and disowned her. The mother cursed him to become a stone as punishment. The mountain of Antria 
looming over the area of Tositeli in present-day Greece. It's known for its forests, freshwater springs, and old legends about girls who turned into stone. Singhasan Batisi is a collection of Indian folktales. The title literally means 32 Tales of the Throne. In the frame story, the 11th century king Boja discovers the throne of the legendary ancient king Vikramaditya, and the throne had 32 statues who were actually Asparas that had been turned into stone due to a curse. There are actually many references in the Vedas referring to this curse that turns people into stones. A legend told at Karnak states that the Karnak stones were once pagan soldiers who were turned into stone by Pope Cornelius who was fleeing from them. So again, they're claiming that this stuff is magic, but what if it's some type of technology or antiquitech? As we will see, maybe they learned about this because it happens in nature frequently and during cataclysms, many are turned into stone, but isn't it interesting that this legend was shared around the world by almost every culture? This is translated into the modern day with concepts such as gargoyles and demons by night, and as the sun rises, they turn into stone again. Then we have the most famous story of them all with Lot's wife, as she looked back on Sodom, she was turned into stone. And it's not as crazy as it really sounds. I mean, outside of myth, we know that petrifaction does happen with every living thing. I mean, that's what we call fossils or even the lie of dinosaurs, which is out of the scope of this video. But what if just like our timeline, they lied or simply used faulty equipment and or started from a false premise on the dating of most of these fossils and geological forms. There are several legends of dinosaurs and other fantastic creatures being here just centuries ago, so is it possible that they all turn to stone too? We know that trees can petrify, but the difference is, is that they tell you this takes millions of years. What if it doesn't and all it takes is some type of cataclysm, intense heat, or even some type of plasmic apocalypse? So now that we can entertain that idea, well, what about buildings? Sure, they're basically already made from stone, but what if an event could turn them into a solid form? And or after the ages, these massive ancient megaliths slowly transformed into the terrain and subterranean formations that we have around us. In my opinion, I think many of these Neolithic circle formations like Stonehenge were purposely constructed in order to give the illusion that this is what the ancients were capable of. They were just stone pushing pagan Neanderthals, that's what they want you to think. Don't look at all the nearby cathedrals that the Catholic Jesuit church took over. No, look at these formations and give them some type of legend to continue going so that we really just think that the ancients were cavemen. One thing that I thought that was super interesting is this cave called the Cavern of Lost Souls. There's a lot of mystery to this place and it's pretty famous on the internet now because all these cars from the 80s are down in the cave and no one knows how or why they were put down there. There's like thousands of them all stacked upon each other and I was watching this video and they found the sword down there and they were talking about how the Cave of Lost Souls is associated with King Arthur. There really isn't too much information on this online or official information, but it's basically just said that it's an abandoned mine and to me, it doesn't really look that there's any way they carved all this way out. It sort of looks like some kind of ancient Skyrim map. It really just makes you wonder if other caves could be the petrified remains of old castles such as King Arthur's cave and Merlin's cave that have these arched entrances. There's this really awesome video that talks about the location of Sodom and Gomorrah being located in the Dead Sea. I'll leave the full video in the description. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters, who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. Lot, his wife and daughters, all fled from the terrible destruction of Sodom. Likewise as it was also in the days of Lot, 
They ate. They drank. They bought. They sold. They planted. They built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Wicked men were punished by the Lord in the divine judgment of fire. The intense heat consumed the wicked cities and their inhabitants. But Lot's wife looked back toward her beloved Sodom, violating the angel's command, and was thus turned into a pillar of salt. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example of those who afterward would live ungodly. This is a visible example that is mentioned here. The Bible tells us the cities were in the plain of Jordan, which is the area surrounding the Dead Sea, and it was once a beautiful, lush area. At 1,300 feet below sea level, this is the lowest place on earth, a very hot and desolate region that was cursed by God because of the sins of the people. Sodom had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Flavius Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, tells us, There are still the remainders of that divine fire, and the traces of the five cities are still to be seen. Popular thought has it that the cities were later covered by the waters of the Dead Sea, but if Josephus could see the cities in his day, then we should be able to view them also, as the water level has, if anything, receded since his time. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as you go toward Gerar, as far as Gaza, then as you go toward Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim, as far as Lasha. The biblical description tells us the cities were spread out, forming a line along the Canaanite border, not grouped together in one area, as some may think. Driving along the coastal highway of the Dead Sea in Israel, one can soon see peculiar formations that are of a lighter color than the surrounding terrain. These are the ashen cities, destroyed by the wrath of God. These cities were consumed by intense flames, a supernatural heat that was directed by the hand of God. Today there is ash that is of lighter color than the surrounding mountains and terrain. As mentioned in the Bible, this is a desolate area where nothing grows. Inspecting the formations closely, one can see structures containing man-made elements, such as 90-degree angles. Even though the buildings were consumed by the fire, the remaining ash in these cities is comprised of a heavier material due to the inclusion of brimstone or sulfur and still retains some of the original shapes of man-made structures. This stunning structure stands out as a singular formation with four sides surrounded by a deep moat. We move in closer to inspect the unusual features evident on the side of the formation. On the side of the structure, this swirling pattern is different from any type of sedimentary rock or soil that would normally contain horizontal, even layers. These swirling designs were also seen in other ashen formations in the cities. This is evidence of extreme heat, up to 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit, where thermal ionization occurs, when the electrons repel and attract 
forming these unusual, swirling designs. So I mean, at this point, everything really becomes questionable. The Grand Canyon, Sedona in Arizona, which is known for having this very mystical energy and these formations that kind of debunk any type of erosion argument. A recent viewer made this comment about riding on stone in Provincial Park in Canada. It really does look like a bunch of melted structures to me. And you really just see these types of structures all around the world. It's very difficult for people to realize that we have been fed lies almost our entire lifetime from the education system on history and geology that it almost creates cognitive dissonance even to entertain these ideas. It's so unbelievable to come to the conclusion that everything we ever knew is a lie. They tell us that these mountains take millions of years to form through erosion or volcanic activity. They teach us this as small children so that we never question it growing up. It's one of the most fundamental basic questions that we ask. Where do mountains come from? If only we knew that these are part of an old world advanced civilization. So advanced that it is the foundation of everything we know today. They possess advanced technology and learn to take control of aether energy and use this freely to operate their society. The oldest buildings are the most massive, and you can see in many cases where later civilizations begin to build upon older foundations. There are situations where part of the building is literally melting and or sinking into the ground. Some type of event happened and wiped this advanced civilization out. It's said that these architectures around the world were positioned as a motherboard in order to take control of this realm's natural ley lines and to exchange the energy between buildings. This could have led to some type of burnout situation, or maybe the entire system overloaded and caused a melting process, completely dissolving some locations and petrifying others. Many of these landforms are also the remainder of massive trees that once roamed this earth, where this advanced civilization lived in harmony with nature. These massive trees also contributed to the creation of many of these landforms after the great cataclysmic event. It's all around us hidden in plain sight. We just haven't had the eyes to question these formations. It's all been kept secret by the founders of the world who inherited everything from the old world. This meltdown could have caused some type of plasma apocalypse in which serpent-like plasma formations in the sky came down and started melting this old world. We see this idea of fire from the sky in many legends. Is the dragon another reference for this phenomena? With this fire breathing in the sky, it too being a serpent symbol. There's also the consideration that this happened through multiple events, one event being acid rain, and or the sun became too hot to handle in which ancient man had to retreat underground in order to survive. This contributed to multiple stages of melting in which these buildings would melt, harden, and then be melted again through a variety of different stages. There's also this concept of advanced energy weapons in the past. Is it possible that someone in the old world took advantage of an ancient weapon in order to wipe out certain enemies? Something powerful such as the Ark of the Covenant that possessed a great source of energy. This is the huge mystery that's been kept from us. For if we knew that there was an old civilization just a couple hundred years ago that possessed advanced technology, and that time and time again there have been several cataclysms, as referenced by Plato, then we wouldn't be able to fall into the slavery of the new world as easily, as it becomes obvious this is what the new rulers had planned for us. We really appreciate all the support, and if you guys have any suggestions please leave them in the comments. And like always, all we can hope is that our minds may be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?